I'm here with Judy Corey. The expression legend of the fair is often used just because somebody has gray hair. But in this case, my guest really is a legend of the fair and has gray hair. Judy, thanks so much for being with us. Oh, thank you. I, I'm excited. Let's just jump into it. Tell us how you got into the fair. Well, uh, I was a listener of KPFK, and I heard that they were going to have a fair. So I went into the station, and there was a room where Phyllis was, and there was a board, one of those whiteboards up on the wall, and there were lists of uh, different characters, and she would write down on, up there people's names and give them an assignment. And she asked me what I wanted to do. And I, I said, I was a craft person. She says, what do you do? And I said, I make dolls. And I was making those dolls for the People's World, which was a communist newspaper that my uncle had taken me uh, ever since I was three years old. He would take me to, to uh, get, get his paper and give me a Curry's Mile High ice cream cone. So I think those ice cream cones were still in my mind. And I was making those dolls. and can you make? I said, oh, one a week. <laughs> I had a husband and a child and so on. And so she said, I think you can be an orange seller. You'll be an orange seller. And she wrote me up as an orange seller. Well, on the first day of the fair, the Haskell's Rascals, a camp for kids, there was a garage and in it were lots of apples. So I got a basket of apples and I hadn't been performing. I'd written a poem that got in the school newspaper. I, when I was 10 years old, I'd gone into the closet in the school and shut the door and sang that old black magic and ran my hands up and down my body. You know, like the secret <laughs> desire to be like those movie stars on the screen. I'm 88 years old, so my memories go way back in, in with movies. Anyhow, there I was in the first day with all these apples. So I took a basket, put apples in it, and I was wearing a, you won't believe this, a purple skirt. Now, the fair costume police would not allow that. Not at that time. And I wore a black felt bodice uh, for you costume people and a short sleeve Mexican blouse. But on my head, although it was lavender, was a, an organza cap that I copied it out of a Bruegel painting. And I had my basket of apples. And I had a beautiful uh, antique uh, German silver purse hanging from a, my belt. And I'd taken the little coin purse and I put it in my cleavage. The first fair cleavage. Of course, it was the first fair cleavage, but I think I, I thought it was. Anyhow, I put my coin purse in there. And then I went around with my head up in the air because I was afraid to look at anybody in the eyes. And I sang my song, apples, fresh apples, come buy one from me. Try my cold, juicy fruit, picked off me own tree apples. And sure enough, people would show up and get apples, but I wouldn't look them in the face. I was too scared to. So I was standing there when all of a sudden in front of my face was a hand with a quarter. I think the apples were 15 cents. Hands me the quarter. I open up my little purse. I take it out, put it back in. Then I reach for an apple and hand it to my left without looking. And I hear this man say, I don't want an apple. And I went, you don't? He said, no, I just wanted to see you make change. <laughs> and when I heard that, I just, wow, something, all the fear went away. And I, all I could think about was, having fun creating fun what could i do next what, what's going to happen and then i was freed i was totally freed up ha! Ha! i joined i ran away and no, i never ran away i went back home too but uh i would i became a fair fair what can i say a fair person after that never went back after that it became my life when i started fair the queen was louisa puig and to me, she's been the epitome of what a queen should be because she framed everybody around her and made everybody around her 
feel like in the presence of a queen. Who was your first queen? Well, she wasn't, I didn't know that she was queen at the time, but the queen at the time was Rachel Rosenthal. But my first queen, having a connection with the queen, oh my goodness, um, Julie Meredith, there, there she is. She was a known folk singer and had an album. And she had a beautiful gown, which she had made herself. And she was smiling all the time and very, very kind. And we didn't have all the songs that we had afterwards for the Queen. And we were quite, we weren't Elizabethan yet. I don't remember too much um, more of, of her other than that she was charming and very pleasant. For many years, you were the Lord Mayor's wife. Yes. How did you get to be the Lord Mayor's wife? Well, so much of what I did at the fair was because I was asked to. I was friends with Ron and Phyllis. I started working with them as we were colleagues. And sometimes Ron would suggest something or they would say something to me and then I would just take it on. They would give me something I could, I could follow through. Um, okay, I forgot the question. <laughs> uh, Lord Mayor's wife. Oh, Lord, Lord Mayor's wife. Yes, that was one suggestion. And Kenny Milken, who was my old man at the time, he was the first uh, Lord Mayor. I had six of them all together. One of the best was Scott Beach, both in Northern and Southern California. And he was amazing. Um, what was your approach to the Lord Mayor's wife? I mean, what was her reason to be there? Number one, because I was asked to. Well, it was to be a wife in a very old fashioned sense. And my husband was the one who told me what to do or advised me what to do. In other words, my husband wore the slops in the family. It, when I look, when I look back on it later, you know, after, after I was no longer doing fair, I kind of got, goodness me, I, I was, certainly wasn't being a feminist. I never rebel. I could have theatrically uh, rebelled, not, not to destroy the show, but in some way to show maybe some annoyance or some impatience with what I had to do or be, but I never did that. But one of the things I got to do was meet the queen. Uh, during the queen show, the, the uh, Lord Mayor's wife is introduced. So I got to kneel before the queen. I did some a comic bit of that kneeling to get a little giggle from the audience. But sometimes it was very real for me. I pretended all my life, ever since I was a kid, and, and so sometimes it was very real for me, and I loved it. You've also taught a lot of workshops? Yes, I think I taught around 5,000 people. Uh, some of them returns, I would imagine. I taught vocal exercises. Mainly what I was interested in is finding out a way to strengthen whatever they were up to, to make it comfortable and easy for them to be outrageous if that's what they wanted to do. One of the fun things for me in teaching was I would ask the participants what it is they would like to do or something that they're not doing or didn't think they were doing well, something that they'd like to work on. And they would tell me. I knew a lot of exercises and I had made up exercises. So right there on the spot, I would make up exercises a combination of exercises for them, for each person or in the group. And then at the end of the class, they were doing what they said they couldn't do. <laughs> that was so much fun. That was fun. Can you uh, remember some exercises now? Well, when I taught the um, Hawking workshops, I knew they would work. I remember doing them at, what was the, the fair with the lake? The one in Devor, yes. Oh, yeah. I remember I had only 10 people in the morning, and people liked it so much that there was 100 in the last one. So that, that one I know worked. And what it was, I would line up people so they had a partner. And the, I would say they were about 10 feet apart, these two lines facing each other. I would have the first line. Oh, here, this is something I have to put in here. Phil, I learned something from Phyllis. I taught workshop in the woods and I taught comedia in the workshop in the woods. And it was Dick Bagwell 
who ran a workshop in the woods and started that for school classes coming out the fair. And she said, if they have to do it by themselves, they'll be too scared to do it. But if they all do it in a group, then, then they'll be comfortable with it. So that's why I had, had the lineup, you know, with partners. They have a partner now and they're in two lines. They have to project this word loudly to the other person. And it has to have a certain dramatic quality to it. Now they're hawking. So they have to be almost seductive in which they send that word out loudly. They have to inspire the people across from them. So when that person spoke the word, their partner across from them had to say either yes or no, shake their head or nod their head. If it didn't, no pass, they could say no pass. And then they had to do it again until they got it. And they always did. They eventually did get it. And rather quickly, too. So this, and we went down the line. And then the other line would have to do that back. It ended up with the end of the workshop where a group of five or six would have to come up with a hawking song and sing it for all the other groups that the people had been put into. And, and that worked. And people loved that. One of my most favorite people was Sandra Cadell when she sold this big fish to be all out of fish to people. That was wonderful. I just loved that. She was great at that. One of the great things about the fair is that you had a large number of actors all basically there, you know, in this Elizabethan village selling stuff. Everybody reinforced that impression to a visitor. So the visitor would come and then the mongers would sell them stuff and they'd go up to a booth and the booth people would, tr you know, in character. To get that level of commitment from so many people, I guess the question is, can you explain how that sort of happened? Wow. I, coming from that commitment, I had that commitment. So I can, thank you for bringing that up. I'm looking and I think it starts with Phyllis's commitment. Mm -hmm. Rachel Rosenthal had workshops. She was the first queen and brought her company, her improvisational company, uh, to, to the first fair. And she invited Ron and Phyllis and I to take her workshops. And I think this was right after first fair. And her workshops were very powerful. And they were about theater, not about acting, about the context and the blueprint the details of theater itself, which I, I could tell you about, but, and I think that affected, Phil, it was important for Phyllis, who had already had her own, I think it was radio company, telling stories, uh, but it affected Ron and Phyllis and myself, and it was a commitment and a base for us to perform on it. Now, I would say that it was Ron and Phyllis that were responsible for for that, for the commitment in people to how they were being, it, it had it had to be. And then, I don't know. I think we were all wonderful. <laughs> I've been to other fairs. I've consulted for other fairs, and we were all wonderful there. And the amazing thing to me is that I can go to a fair now, and I can see that same sort of commitment in the actors at this fair who have probably don't know where, where Agora is, but at the same time, they're out there hawking and they're out there performing and they're out there engaging with the audience. From where you started, you know, in somebody in, in Phyllis's garage selling apples to oh, all no, these- Oh, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I wasn't, the apples were stored in the garage. Oh, they were stored it was out in the garage. I'm sorry. Oh, my goodness. No, the garage was outside of the fair itself. The fair was Got on it. the campground of rascals, rascals. <laughs> but the, the point is that, you know, you guys started something that's still an active part of many people's lives. I'm looking at all the other kinds of events in our culture where people get together. And we... The thing about fairs all of, is that you have to do it yourself, and yet you're part of a team. 
And there's an overall theme that might vary from fair to fair, though I think ours is the best. I, it's something about people that when they're in that kind of environment, that they get together. That is, I said so say something, say something good about people. <laughs> I really do that we get together. That it's on nature that when we're that when we're together and we're creating something, that that this commitment occurs. That it's so much fun, and you're being with other people having fun. And how are we going to put this together? I mean, the person who was head of the parking lot in in a girl was a mathematician <laughs> in real life. <laughs> Oh. I remember Morning Gate. That was a lot of fun. Oh, Morning Gate. Yeah, awake. I just. Yes. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Uh -oh. Awake, awake. Da, 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 da. Good craftsmen, open your stalls. Da, da, da. Oh, dear. I used to know this by heart. Uh, uh, the fair is open to all. And Sue Honor with St. Cuthbert Gill. Yeah. Uh, outside the fair and marching through. Brilliant, brilliant. That was absolutely a wonderful way. And then the people, the fair, when the fair was open, they would start in and then the customers would follow that. You know, it was a great way to open, my goodness. So many things that we that we started, you know. Wow. This is kind of a I hope a related question. But do you remember the Agora Fair site? before the fair came there and who decided to make Agora the next site of fair? Because you, you tell me that there was a succession of fair sites until Agora happened. The first, yes, the first one was Haskell's Rascals in North Hollywood near the Beverly Garland Hotel now. Uh, the second one was on uh, highway, highway, the Ridge Route, I think Highway 99. Uh, and that was uh, Dr. Rose's Ranch. And uh, I'll tell you about April Eves uh, after this. And after that was the third fair was in Agora. Of course, Ron and Phil had to go out and, and make those choices. And I know nothing about them. And I remember seeing the fair before things were built and how beautiful the trees were. My husband at the time, said it reminded him of the Cotswolds in England. You know, it was just beautiful. And then we went to um, the fourth fair was canceled because of some uh, stern uh, religious people. The uh, wife of actor Walter Brennan. And um, I think I might have helped bring that fair down. because I did, I did an improv. It was all improv. I was squatting. And I was being a hen laying eggs. And I called the other actor being the rooster, my cop. No, it, that was period. And uh, that was in the paper somehow. And it was considered obscene somehow. And was, I guess, a good, a good excuse and illustration why to close it down. <laughs> and that was a sad, horrible day when that happened. And then we returned the next year to Agora again and stayed there a long time until the end. You mentioned something about April Eve? Yes. The, the, uh, in the beginning, it was volunteers who were used for during the fair. I don't recall for what, but for what participants later took over, whether it was managing stages or whatever it was. And there would be April Eves, which were evenings for the volunteers and staff and Phyllis and Ron and myself and David Osman, who was the youngest radio programmer in the nation at the time, he was about 26 years old. He was the one who uh, was one of the founders of the Firesign Theater. Okay, um, April Eve. So there would be cheese and wine. It would be a Dr. Rose's little tiny, it looked like a mansion, but it was a small version of a mansion on Franklin Avenue, just west of La Brea. And we would entertain them. And I remember that David and I would read the letters of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, the real letters. Uh -huh. So neither of us looked like the part. We did that once we uh, used the whiskey at go go one year when it was empty, of course, for that also. And then Phyllis stopped having volunteers and we had participants instead. 
And the thing about she said about uh, I'm one quarter verbatim, but was that was that volunteers could not be relied upon to be there on time and come back and so on. So she, she enlarged her staff and 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 then had uh, other people as well that were volunteers. One of the things I think is unique about fair is that whole guild structure, uh, and that there is this sort of diffuse management style that the guilds are kind of responsible for themselves but then it's a mechanism by which sort of the spirit of the fair is transmitted down to the individual participant do you know where the guild system came from or was that phyllis and ron as well i don't know it might have been a participant who came up with it and one of the things i want to insert here is that Phyllis encouraged people. I think it was part of instant theater because in instant theater, anyone could perform. Being, the exercises were set up so anyone could perform. Mm -hmm. And it would be clean, clear, precise, wh whatever, uh, theatrical. And so she had this a way of, I ha well, I, I, I took that on also in that I would assume that people could do what I asked them to do or could take on a role. And rarely was that not the case. I would assume that people could do something, that people had abilities, and mostly that happened. I think for <laughs> a lot of people, fear was the first time that they were given a responsibility. And you're right, people basically learned sort of responsibility and teamwork there. Yes. You call them clans? I, did you mm -hmm. just, the, oh, the, the guild structure. The guild structure. Okay. Well, of course, the clans. Wow. They were, uh, they were wonderful and, and well-organized and uh, strong. Now, I started a guild with a friend, with Prema Elvin. She did Balinese puppets, you know, with the shadow puppets. And she and I started this children's guild so that children would have something to do and be part of it and uh, be like you said, taking on responsibility and being part of the team. It was St. Anne's Guild and we had our own shield on a pole in the parade. Anyhow, we did that and we had games. Also down south, I ran a workshop of Kevin Patterson was in it when he was a kid. Kevin did something for me out of his that participation. I was at Ron's Memorial. And I was, and there was uh, like a stage that, that uh, Kevin was up on with other people and that where the screen was for video. And I was down on the floor with my wonderful friend and accompanist, Ellen Hoffman, the greatest piano player in the world. And, and I was gonna sing a song, A Life is Just a Bowl of Cherries. And Kevin said, you come up here and he brought me up onto the stage, you belong up here. Well, when he was on main stage for the first time, I said to him something like, take the stage. It's your stage. And he got it. He got it. That's what I got out of instant theater as well. So he was able to give that to me at Ron's memorial. It was very nice. If you were to try to sort of convince someone to go out to fair, who's never been out to fair, what would you tell them to sort of expect or experience? Golly, I think whatever I say would enroll them because I would <laughs> just tell them how it is. It's just wonderful. And you don't want to miss it. This, where You'll have a lot of fun and people will come up to you and talk to you in their costumes and, and you can get all dressed up. And, and if you don't want to, you don't have to. And uh, you can watch whatever you want to. You can even get up on stage if there, if there are participant shows, you know, whether they take somebody out of the audience like I used to do. The food, oh, the turkey legs. The turkey legs are wonderful. Ha! Oh, you'll just have a great time. There'll be so much people to see, so much things to do, so many beautiful things to buy. And the whole place is staged and you're on it. Go for it. Did you ever have a booth? Oh, yes. Yes, I had a booth. 
couple times during before 19, no, around 1970, I had a house on chicken legs. I had a Baba Yaga's booth and it was in Agora and it was where the, right before Witch's Wood, where the stream crosses the road. I would tell stories there to kids and that the mountain behind us was a sleeping giant. And then I would sell my crocheted bag and hats and Kenny Milliken was in the booth. And when I wasn't in the booth, I wore a long bamboo pole across my head and hang things from it and walk through the fair and sell them. But Kenny built this marvelous, marvelous booth. First of all, the grand was slanting and he used, I guess, two by fours of posts, only two on slanting ground and put this structure on and 10 people could sit up in there and get stone. Ten Where there's a will, in. there's a way. Yes. So that was that booth. When I sold my house, it was sold in the backyard as a, as a toy house. But the thing, I, and I gave up at that point selling because people thought I charged too much. Huh. Oh, I made a full cape, right? And they were beautiful and well done. I won a prize. And that was a thing to be proud of. My fellow craftsmen voted me. I, it was a tie between me and another craftsman. And, but I wanted $50 for my garment, which took hours and hours to make. And wool yarn, good quality yarn. And the person thought I said 15 <laughs> <laughs> and walked away. So I, I gave up that booth. The thing is, the person who was supposed to make my little wooden plaque it took a couple of years and didn't get around to making me my award, which I was so attached to and proud of. So at Northern Fair, so Phyllis took care of that. I'm up at Northern Fair. I'm on stage with Scott Beach as his, as his wife. He's the Lord Mayor with his wonderful booming voice. Oh, Bob, oh, I just can't think of his name, is playing the, the sheriff. And we are upstage at the little entrance there, right in the center. And we're standing there. Now here, I have this thing of always staying in character. Don't refer to names. Don't refer to anything outside of there or another language. Always staying in character. And I was rigid with that. I'm standing back there and I hear Scott say, Judy Corey. And I go, what? And I step forward and Bob said, don't step on his line. So I stand there while Scott is, is uh, praising me and has got something for me. And I step forward and what I was given was one of those velvet ropes with a big bronze medal on it. So I have a, a craftsman's medal, which I'm also very proud of. And he presented it to me. <laughs> Don't this is way one. out of scope of, did Mark Lewis ever tell stories with you or did you share techniques with him or? Oh no, he was, he was a star on his own. Yeah. This man, just being able to sit there and listen to him at night was wonderful. I have one of his tapes for a show he did. It's just remarkable. Big, yeah, I said, just think of him being gone. Well, that wonderful, he was the best. I never heard anybody top him. Any fair, fair storytellers top him. He made it all. He did it all. And he involved the audience in ways that I haven't really seen a lot of other people do ever. Yeah. Gosh, I'm running out of questions. Uh, I, I haven't run out of answers. <laughs> <laughs> I taught my one woman shows. I can tell you about that. Oh, please do. Yeah, one, one woman plus audience <laughs> participation shows. Doris Carnes, who was an actress, and her husband was Bob Carnes, an actor in the 40s. She was a close friend uh, with Phyllis and, and Ron. She said to me, why don't you do a show about Lady Godiva? And I went, oh, okay. Now, this was before Google, okay? So I went to the Encyclopedia Britannica, and there was an article about Lady Godiva in the Encyclopedia Britannica. And it was about Leofric, the Earl of Mercia, and his wife, Lady Godiva, and how she protested the taxes. And it was just a paragraph, okay? So I made up a show. I got the costumes from costumes. I figured out the characters. And because of Rachel Rosenfeld's 
training and the work I've been doing, I just got up on stage and improvised the first day. Okay. And then each time I would perform it, I would refine it. Uh, first part of the show was picking people out of the audience and showing them how to do the part. And this was also was entertaining because it had to be. This is a show. So uh, and people got to do things they'd never done before. These are not people who came to workshop. As the narrator, I kept it going and I stayed in character as the narrator. So I would start by saying, oh, my, my cast has run away. I'll need your help. <laughs> and that's how I started. I, gave, I, I picked out people from the audience, aligned them up on stage, and then I gave them, showed them how to do their part. And then when they came out to do it, I was there to keep it going and keep it entertaining. And I even gave the audience part. They were the people on, let me see, this side of town. And oh, yes, you can be the people on that side of town. Okay. And then I gave them their parts to do what the yell and so on. And, and the show worked. And I loved it. And I even did it in school. And I, Listen, I knew how to be body, but I, I knew how to censor and still be entertaining <laughs> and appropriate. Oh, so I did school programs. I did comedy. I had a Comedia dell'arte company. And for a while, I was the outreach entertainment director. So uh, I booked myself all over as teaching a school assembly program, taking a group aside and teaching them in a classroom how to play their parts. And I had beautiful costumes made by Diane Longo that were washable from the dye spot. And I do, and we do that show. And then we do an assembly program and they'd be behind the curtain and I'd come out as this person from the past and I'd pick somebody out of the audience to be queen, hopefully a little redheaded girl. <laughs> and this kids love this. I would make the teachers and the staff bow to the queen curtsy to the queen kneel to the queen <laughs> what a great idea <laughs> i was mischievous <laughs> i have often thought that one of the greatest gifts of the fair to the performers at the fair was that they gave us an audience wanting to play and that this audience was continually turning over and so we had that ability, like you mentioned, to refine your bit or your show, because there's always another audience member walking through the fair. Gave you a, a sense as a performer that try anything, and if it doesn't work, so what? And when it did work, it was great. Yeah, you, you, can't, you couldn't fail. You could not fail. Yes, that, that, would, that, that puts it much better. <laughs> yeah it did it did i want to tell you about boomba boomba oh please do you remember that mm -hmm. the, but for those of us why don't you explain boomba boomba well i chose to start a commedia dell'arte company that's italian renaissance comedy that if you trace it well, you could bring it down to Charlie Chaplin or any pratfall in any funny movie. Um, I chose the characters. My company was called no, Comedia della Vita, Comedy uh, of Life. And the show was called Il Salami dell'Amore, The Salami of Love. Now, we had a six-foot salami. Or was it a three-foot salami? And I'm only thinking it was a six-foot salami. But there's a picture of us on Facebook. At the climax of the show was where we all ran and jumped onto that salami that one of the characters was, was holding. I'll just make a little more sense out of this. There is a father with a daughter. Uh, they are upper class. There is a captain who is a mercenary who probably could threaten the town, who wants to marry the daughter. And then there are the servants, Arlequino and Colombina. And Harlequin, or Arlequino, he's the perfect fool, but he's also the wisest, the cleverest, and the most scheming. So he plays all kinds of tricks, which are called Lazzi. So I wanted to get that in. But I remember there was a, 
an Italian man, an elderly Italian man coming to fair. And we were parading around to advertising the, the Comedia, Comedia on such and such a stage at such a time. His, he kind of looked up and I said, we're having a Comedia. And he asked me what it was called. And I said, Il Salami dell'Amore. And he went, oh, no. So I insulted the poor man. But we had a lot of fun of that. And it changed cast. And uh, Billy brought his daughters in and uh, it changed names. And it was like uh, a legend in itself at fair. Yeah, it's great. And then you had the Lady Godiva show. Did you have another show? Yes, it was called uh, Golden Lux and the Three Fools. What a great title. Yeah. The thing about that is people from the fair would come and get into the cast. And I would have children to play the part of um, Goldilocks. But I had the baby bear be played by an adult with a baby bonnet. And so it could go, wow, somebody ate my porridge. And then I would have three people in the back, adults playing the, the trees, waving their hands, waving in the breeze, to play, to play the birds, tweeting in the trees, and to play the chairs, the back of the chairs, and the back of the beds. So I, I, I got as many people involved in that as I could. But everything always ended happily ever after, or with three cheers. And that brought the energy up. Hip, hip, huzzah. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm extrapolating, but you did a lot to establish the audience participation factor of the fair by giving them a part and then providing the context the, so that they can't fail and so that they can just have fun and transmit yeah. that sense of fun yeah. to the people watching. Yeah, I got to tell you something that's very funny to me. At one show, I was given a certain amount of time to do my show. And when they gave me less time, I had this kind of sense of when of timing so that I could end the show when I needed to without having to. I didn't have a watch, wasn't going to wear a watch, so. I did that. And I noticed that I was, it was getting kind of late and I was picking people out of the audience and this guy wouldn't come up. I wanted him to play peeping Tom. Now this man had a shirt open to his waist. He was wearing tights. He had dyed a uh, short hair. Uh, he had a gold chain and a thing around his neck and a fancy blouse and a, and he wouldn't come. And I thought, oh, and I knew I was running out of time. So I just pulled him and he, he let go and came up. He did a wonderful job playing Peeping Tom, you know, with his tongue out and almost drooling and, and his hands wiggling. He was great. Just right. At the He comes out and the audience is leaving and everybody's leaving. And he says, are you an actress? And I said, well, yes. He says, well, you'll never work in this town again. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> he must have been some kind of agent or something. <laughs> well, picking audience members is definitely a skill that you learn out at fair. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have any sort of internal rules on what would make you pick somebody as an audience member? I, I guess I wanted them to look the part. The person who played lightning that strikes Tom dead in the story is always a kid. I usually picked a man to play Lady Godiva. And the man would be riding a hobby horse, one of those beautiful hobby horses that Doris built. And there would be some, some legs on the outside of it while he was you know, walking inside the horse. And he would have these breasts that Doris had made, which were pink cotton with red cotton nipples that held on by a harness. I, I, I'm and familiar he, with the costume, yeah. You're familiar with the costume. And then you have a long, well, Diane made the costume. So these are long strands of yellow dyed fabric for the hair. Uh, what was the question? I forgot. What made you select a man for Godiva? Frankly, for the laughs. For the cheap laughs. <laughs> A woman would have done just as well. A lot of people would think that was funny. I was shameless. And also I thought they could do it. Yeah, if they had the looks for the character. I had a trick. 
and you're saying, I need to volunteer to blah, blah, blah. And if somebody was pointing to somebody else, I would pick the guy who was pointing at somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, one of your names could have been the hardest working lady out at fair. Because you were on stage at least three or four hours a day. And then I was in the streets as well. Yeah. I mean, you had, you were fully booked. Uh, what is the word for people who have to do stuff and they have to be in order and there's a compulsive perhaps. Yes. Yes. I had the energy to do that. When I was doing Dickens, I remember Peg Long was in charge of entertainment. She came and dragged me out. Phyllis sent her to drag me out because I would go from morning till night and never stop. Do you want to hear anything about Dickens at all? Sure. Okay. Well, I was mad Sal at Dickens. Huh? I used that character in show a lot to conduct some experiments. And the first one, I took one, a three-hour melodrama by a friend of Dickens and cut it down to, what, 30 minutes? Black-Eyed Susan... And Dennis Day was a villain, and he was a wonderful villain. And I wanted to find out what it would be like to pre pretend to be drunk. So I started with the walk, and I started feeling it, and I walked ar around the fair. And then Kenny, who was my old man at the time, came by later and said, Judy, Judy, are you okay? Uh, what, what happened? What did you drink? <laughs> and I knew it was successful. You know, it was great. Also, later on, when it was at an Army Street, and uh, it was a naval warehouse, and there was a wooden room. It was like a wooden office building, and that was my mad cell then. Uh, and we had a bar and a stage, and I thought, I want to know what it feels like to do a show where the, the show, somebody sings, the show is stopped, and they don't applaud. It stops the show kind of thing. So I wrote a body song. It was about the customers that, that came during the week because Mad Cell was always supposed to be kind of a, a secret uh, body house, not just a, a tavern. So it was something like, oh, the Admiral came on Monday to see what he could see. His vessel leaked and the girls all shrieked and so he got it free. Oh, belly up to the bar, boys, belly up to the bar, and so on and so on and so forth. So I had one song before that. Then I did that song, and then I went and took this period song, and I delivered it dramatically and seriously, straight. I delivered it straight, and it really tragic. It was tragic, not not melodramatic, and it stopped the show. And it, oh, that was great. Okay, there was a guy there who was Welsh, really Welsh, and he would come in and he had a beard, and I called him Albert. I forget his real name, and uh, the place was a mess. And so I said, oh, dear, Albert, you know what? At first I wanted to get them hyped up, cheerful. I've got news, said something like that. Albert's, Albert's wife has produced twins. Hurrah! And so they all cheered. But Albert isn't here. What are we going to do? Look at the mess. Oh, I'm so sorry. And the audience all picked up the mess and cleaned up the place. <laughs> I don't know what I exactly said, but I love doing things like that. <laughs> Big believer in the fourth wall. Uh, I, I, I have encountered it. I, 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 I did have an actor's equity card a long time ago. <laughs> well, that's one of the great things about fair is that if you have an idea like that, you can execute it in front of an audience within seconds of thinking about it and you can do it 30 or 40 times in a weekend. Yeah. And well, that's, that's the thing. All those other volunteers who, who go out in the streets, hopefully, and interact with people, that's where they're coming from, too. They get to do, they get to do stuff right away. They get that out of workshop. They, that's part of being a fair person. Exactly. Exactly what you said. Well, I think I've said this before, but I, I definitely meant this time, but I've kind of run out of words. Okay. I just, I'm going to, 
Did I talk too much or too much? About no, that? you were perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess she whiz. Um, and you did a very good job of mentioning other people. And you did a very good job of sort of giving credit and emphasizing the deep aspects of FAIR. So you did a very good job of not only talking about FAIR experience, but you illustrated it by the way you were talking. And so I was very pleased. Okay, good. The only thing that I would say is that I, I did consult other fairs and I brought what I got out of my experience from participating and expressing myself and creating and being and absorbing everybody around me and engaging and what I got from all the other people. I brought that. I just want to mention this. I consulted for the Kansas City Renaissance Festival and Dick Bagwell got that gig and it was wonderful. <laughs> so I did workshops for all the people. What I brought was getting them all together. They'd been divided in some ways uh, in sections by the management. I united them and got together and there was a lot of love we experienced. I'm thankful to to the fair, to Ron and Phyllis, and my experiences there, and what I learned there, to bring that to another fair. And then finally, I did the University of Eastern New Mexico, their drama and theater department hired me. And that was a wonderful gig, too. And they did a fair for their town. And I got, and I got to do that one and teach them. I went to other people's workshops at fair, and I learned from that. Okay, social customs and et cetera. And then I brought that to that fair. And then I got to do some school programs for them, dancing and so on. The thing is, I'm seeing something that if you hadn't asked these questions, I, I wouldn't have been able to see this in this context. Uh, and it makes a difference in my life to be aware of this, that I was taking love from California and bringing love to, to uh, Clovis, New Mexico and um, Kansas City, you know, and, and in getting people ex to be able to express and in, in, improvise. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I think I'll stop recording now. Good. Well, well that's my interview with Judy Corey, recorded November 2022. If you have questions or comments you'd like to have me forward to Judy, you can email them to djng at earthlink.net. Questions or comments to me can be sent to me at djng at earthlink.net. Finally, if you would like to appear on Fair Folk at Work, give me an email at dj ng at earthlink.net. This is Dan saying bye-bye for now. Thanks for listening.